So I was going down a rabbit hole by myself one time, looking at these Hyksos names with the Yah in it, and I compared it to the Yahweh of the Shashu, and I'm trying to think, is this the same God or not? The Shashu of Yahu, they appear in two temples that are in modern day Sudan. Yahubidi was a Hittite, and he was king of Hamat, northern Syria, and his name has Yahu in it, but we do know that in this case, this is a theophoric element in his name because it has the dinger simplifying. Mentioned that Kanum and Yao are side by side uh, in the name of Kanum and Yao. The face of the high priest of, of Jerusalem on the coin. At the same time, the Torah says not to produce any image. We have a coin from a little bit later on, towards the end of the fourth century, military leader minting his own coin with his name. And on the flip side, you see Zeus. So the names of literary heroes like Abraham, Moses, Aaron, even Sarah, Rachel, Joseph, Levi, all of these names from the Bible are completely non-existent up until the end, the very end of the fourth century for the common era, really into the third century before the end. These names are, are non-existent in the, in, in the record at all. These names are not names that are found in the lists of names or any document. This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, the global men's lifestyle brand that is once again setting the bar higher for men's grooming standards. With the holidays just around the corner, the perfect time to treat yourself or even a loved one to the ultimate grooming package, the ultimate grooming experience with Manscaped's latest release, the Chairman Pro Package. I'm all decked out for this Christmas. As you can see, I'm edged up, ready to go, ready to record some videos. This all-in-one set includes everything you need for a perfect shave. Every time, making it an ideal gift for those looking to elevate their grooming game this season. Get ready to shine and gift confidently. Let's see what Santa brought us this Christmas. Whoa! Precision trimmer edge. With the holidays just around the corner. First up, we have the star of the show, the Chairman Pro Electric Foil Shaver. This isn't just any shaver. It features a 360 degree contouring head and comes with two interchangeable skin safe blade heads. You've got the skin safe four blade foil for a super close shave and the skin safe stubble trimmer for when you want to keep a bit of that rugged look. Both heads are designed to help reduce razor burn and irritation. So you're always feeling smooth and comfortable, ready to impress the holiday season. And yes, it's waterproof, so you can use it in the shower, making your grooming routine even easier. Now what I like about this is the flex adjust technology, the blades and pivoting head flex, and adjust to the contours of your face and neck, ensuring you get a close, comfortable shave no matter what the angle. It's all about that perfect contact with your skin. It's powerful enough to handle up to five day growth. So whether you shave daily or you just need to clean up after a few days, the Chairman Pro has you covered with up to 75 minutes of runtime on a single charge. I've, I've seen it work. You won't have to worry about running out of juice mid shave. The package also includes the power shave gel to get the ultimate wet shave experience. This non irritating lubricating formula is made specifically to work with the Chairman Pro, providing a smooth, comfortable shave. And to finish off, the Face Shave Soother. This aftershave serum is a game changer. Use it after shaving to hydrate and soothe any post-shave irritation. It's designed to help reduce redness and defend against ingrown hair and razor bumps. Dermatologist tested, dye-free, cruelty-free, alcohol-free. If you're looking for the perfect holiday gift this season or just wanna upgrade your grooming routine, the Chairman Pro Package is the way to go. It has everything you need to keep your face looking and feeling its best. All in one box. Use the promo code INFORMANT for 20% off your order, plus free shipping. What a better way to treat yourself or someone else for this holiday season. That's 20% off, plus free international shipping. Plus you're helping out the channel by using my promo code INFORMANT at manscaped.com. Join over 11 million worldwide who trust manscaped.com and give the gift of grooming this season. Welcome back to the Gnostic Performance and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm joined by once again, 
Professor Gad Barnea, who was with us last time, there was a big hit, tons of, a yeah, quarter, quarter, quarter million views, I think, more than that, actually. And uh, we're going to go, this is like a part two to that, because the book is out now. Before the book wasn't out, now the book's out. The link's in the description, and you can get it for free right now. So we have a lot to discuss regarding this book, You're About to Attain True Gnosis. Last time we talked, you were sort of, we didn't get too much into Judea. We weren't sort of staying on Elephantine a little bit. But you mentioned that the the stuff that we find in Judea in the Persian period shows that they're doing kind of the opposite of what Torah is prescribing. Everywhere, not just the Judea. What are some of those Torah. examples? So Elephantine we talked about, of course, yeah. op- 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 opposite what Torah right. um, you know, def- uh, specifies. In Judea... And in Samaria, I mean, there are no. There, we should not separate the two. These are two Yahwistic Sense. regions that are very much in, in, in kind of in sync, or at least, I mean, we should not also look at them as as as, as unified. There are differences between the Samarian Yahwism and Judean Yahwism, but they are part of the same milieu. They are part of the same world or the same sphere in Yahud in Judea, in the uh, province of Judea. Uh, we have mostly. Coins, right? You mentioned that we don't have any, almost any texts from that period. Very, very few texts. Uh, we have texts earlier than that, like from Lachish and places like that. But in the Persian period, very, very little textual material. The coins are very interesting, and, and the coins are only from the fourth century on, so not from the fifth century. Right. Um, that is also very interesting. Not the fifth century? No. Okay. I thought. I, I thought. I, I, not. I'm not listening. Judean coins. Okay, because I thought. I, I thought there was some. 450 BC coins with like Athena on them. Yeah, but not Judean. Where is that one at? Mount Gerizim. That's in the north. That's in the north. And that one, but that's very rare. And also, and, and even the dating of 450 is not exactly 100% sure. That it could be later. Right. The coin is from 450 or around if, that yeah. that time period. But uh, but it does not mean that um, that the where it was found on Mount Gerizim, that precinct, that the temple of Mount Gerizim should be dated to according to this coin, because coins can, I mean, as long as the um, the weight of the coin does not of, of you know of the currency does not change, there is no reason to change coins. Sure. Right? You can keep them for decades. They had a real standard back then. Yeah, exactly. So you can keep them for decades on. It doesn't. The date of the coin does not mean right. That um, that's why you had Alexander the Great's face circulating for centuries. For after. centuries, absolutely. Yeah, coins that are from the that actually say Yahud, you know, the, the province name, or Samaria, Samarin, on them, that's from the 4th century on. Yeah. Which is really interesting as well, because clearly, at around the turn of the 4th century, there was a level of autonomy that was given to Judea and Samaria by the Persians mm-hmm. to start minting their own coins. Right. That is a level of autonomy when you can actually start doing that. So there was something in the um, perspective of the empire Towards the Yahwists, both in Judea and Samaria, that allowed them to actually start minting their own coins. What are they minting? What's on them? What, what does it tell us? So that's very interesting. So some of these coins have, I mean, there's a coin with the face of the high priest, the face of the high priest of, of Jerusalem on the coin. And it's the high name? priest. Yeah, I think it's Hananiah. Oh, wow. The name, I'm, I'm not Hananya. sure. I think it is. I'm not, I'm, I'm not 100% yeah. sure. But I think it's uh, Hanania, and and it says the high priest though on the on the coin, and the face is is I mean it's not profile like in a lot of these coins. He's like looking straight in. Now the fact that the high priest had his own coin puts him pretty much at the same level as the governor. I yeah. mean that's a political force. That uh, at the same time the Torah says not to produce any image, image right? any right. likeness. So this so, this is very. For anyone and this is, the this is very significant. And this is the high this priest. The high priest breaking put, Torah law, if yeah. the Torah, which, which makes me think the Torah law wasn't there yet. That's right. That's but right. Yeah. If, the, if the Torah, let's say it was for the sake of the century. Yeah, fourth century. Fourth century. We're talking 300s. We're talking the Torah is right around the corner, according to the source. Or the Pentateuch, I'm sorry. Uh, the Greek Septuagint yeah. is right around the corner a century later. So, like, wait a minute. We're talking about. High priest is going to break Torah law to mint an image of his own face. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, he did not, you know, which, know which makes us think the time. Torah wasn't around. Yet. That's right. That's right. So that's that's is very that's huge. That's very significant. That's that's very significant. Now we have a coin from a little bit later on 
towards the end of the 4th century from the north, uh, so from Samaria, where we have a Jewish or Yahwistic military leader minting his own coin with his name. He has a Yahwistic name. I forget now what the name is, but but it is it has Yahoo it is in, Yahoo. in it. And uh, so it's a Yahwistic name. And, and you see him on his horse. You see his name. And on the flip side, you see Zeus. <laughs> Not Yahoo, Zeus, but Zeus uh, as as the deity that he has for. So yeah, so, so much for they're only being Hellenized after Alexander. That's right. They're, they're getting from, good. They're borrowing from the Greeks before Alexander. That's right. That's I right. mean, it's Mediterranean world. And, and Zeus specifically. And uh, you're right, yeah. absolutely. I mean, you mentioned Athena. Uh, yeah. I mean, just the, the Athena coins that were before uh, before uh, Yahud minted their own coins and after. Right. It continued as well. So this assimilation of cultic practices, of deities, of all of this, all, assimilation across the board was very strong in the ancient world. It wasn't unique to the to the Yahweh, to the Yahwists or the Jewish people. Everyone did that all the time. It was just a very, very dynamic world where people just, I mean, all of these cultic influences were constantly being, you know, there was osmosis between between back and forth between these different cultures. Very fascinating period, very rich, very um, just, I mean, you see that the people were just, the, the, the connections between peoples, the, 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 the dialogue, the give and take, the, all of that was very, very powerful, very popular at the time. There weren't these, these camps where, and that's something, you know, also for us to think about. There weren't these camps where it's, it's just our religion, it's not, you know, we, we, it, it was very, I mean, and that, I think, is... Um, People were more free to, to, to yeah, I mean, worship. Yeah, we shouldn't however. romanticize this either too yeah. much, but you're right that there was, and I think that the, that, the reason for that is simply that they were living under major empires at the time. Yeah. And, and the empire needs this in order to preserve yeah. tranquility. When people start being too tribal, you know, tribal and starting... You always get friction. The, temp- friction. the the empires don't want that, and they and certainly they want to have more assimilation and uh, and dialogue between the different. So they they clearly I I would assume that they kind of really uh, try to make this work. So the evidence that we have between Elephantine, Judah, and even Babylon, what we find is we find the exact opposite of what you would expect to find worshippers of Yahweh doing, which suggests that the laws of the Torah weren't known yet. Also, on top of that, names, people naming their children, are. there's no Moses yet, there's no J- Jacob, there's no... Um, none of the tribes. None, none of them. Yeah. None of the... Anyone, That's right. anyone from the Bible is in there. That's right. The, it's so... This, to me, is like shattering, but world-shattering. But it also describes the people in a way more positive light. These are people who are Yahwist, but they're a lot more earthly, worldly. They're more like they're they're engaging with their neighbors. They're they're, they're just following like, like regular just people. Just like everyone else. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, they were, you know, good citizens of the of the ancient world. They were not different from anyone else uh, at right. that time. They did not want to be different from anyone else, and they had their I mean, yeah, Yahweh or Yahoo was the head of the pantheon. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they understood that there are other deities and um, they sometimes assimilated other deities into their own pantheon, into their own. Yeah. Why not? Um, so why not? And, and that's what everyone, everyone did. I mean, the, right. the Greeks did that. All the, you know, the Phoenicians did that. Everyone did that. The Egyptians also. I mean, the Egyptians had a, a Semitic triad in their, as part of their pantheon. Okay, uh, Reshef, for example, the deity Reshef, the Phoenician deity, was also considered, and Baal as well, were also considered Baal, yeah. as part of the Egyptian pantheon. So, yeah, so this was the way, you know, antiquity worked. Things started only to change later, and we can that we, we certainly don't have time to get into. We don't have time to that, but, but I do want to yeah. ask you. I never got to ask you this question directly. I can kind of sense where you're going with this, but I never asked you, uh, and you're very. You, you don't like to speculate. I know that. So just, I just want to ask you just based on your experience, based on all of your research, if you had to speculate on when you think the Torah, maybe not the Torah, like Genesis and Exodus were composed, what would you say? 
as a conscious effort to create a corpus, which would be the Torah. Yeah. I mean, the Torah is really kind of, there's Genesis, and then there's the other four books that are related in some way to Moses. Right. right. In some way, shape, or form. Right. I mean, Leviticus, Leviticus is very special because it's not, it's just a set of flaws with almost no narrative. I mean, there's no story except for in the beginning and the, and towards the end. There are two stories really kind of small, the, uh, small, small narrative. But all, uh, other than that, it's pretty much almost almost all just a set of, of laws, which wow. is really special. But the but the bookends, I mean, the uh, Exodus and then of course Numbers and into the Deuteronomy, um, those are full of narrative of, um, uh, of, of of stories really surrounding Moses and surrounding the people. Right. Um, so. That corpus, again, I'm not saying that there is there there is there is no material that was older, that, that right, right. incorporated. Yeah. I, mean, I think this. we both agree that there is yeah. there's older layers there. But when do we there's the older material there? Yeah, yeah. But that composition, the enterprise, to that was undertaken to take to 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 put this corpus together, um, was triggered by the Alexandria Library. Wow. Um, in, I agree in my, with that. In my mind, been, I've been sold on that for yeah, a while. Yeah, I think we talked about yeah, this already, and I've been talking about this in, in several venues also. Yeah. And I have a book uh, that I'm working on uh, as well on this. The Alexandria Library, to me, is clearly, uh, and I think we'd beyond doubt, really, yeah. the trigger. So for anyone who doesn't know it, 300, around 300 BC is yeah. when they finished it. I think they start building it well, 20 years before. Yeah. I don't want to talk about finished, yeah. uh, finished the library, but, like, but it's, it's usable. But it's, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. around three hundred, give or take. And that's um, where you think it was composed in the Hebrew. No, 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 no. That was the trigger. Okay, it was composed later on. Really, um, but it was so the Alexandria, li- um, Alexandria as a phenomenon, as as a city, yeah, in the ancient world was so ahead of its time. I mean, it was science fictional. Like, like doors open up from. from there were Stan, automatic like, doors. They had automatic doors in the they ancient had world. Coin operated machines. Oh. <laughs> the, the 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 streets were. But were, this is yeah. I don't want to get into this now. But this the people who talk about the dark ages and then the scholars go, no, it wasn't that dark. You're making me want to lean that way. Yeah, you're making me want to say, well, maybe the dark, maybe the Middle Ages wasn't so great compared to this. Yeah, I know well, that's another topic. That's, that's, that's another, Anyways, that's back another to story. But but yeah. really, uh, Alexandria for antiquity uh, was truly science fictional. I mean, anyone who would come to Alexandria in at that period would just be absolutely blown away. Yeah. They've never seen anything like this. Now, within in that city, there was this huge complex of the palace of the Ptolemies, and within that palace, there was the the place of the muse, the, the of the muses, the museum. And within the museum, there was this, the library, the, the library complex, which was really, uh, we have, we often have this, uh, romantic idea, which is really very, very late. Mm-hmm. Um, the, this idea, this interpretation of, of the library of Alexandria as this cosmopolitan place where they just wanted, they commissioned works from different places and they wanted to keep, uh, to just uh, c- conserve the beauty of humanity and all of its. Yeah. Pluriformity and all of its riches. That's simply not true. Uh, they were they were focused on the Hellenistic world. They were okay with collecting texts from the barbarians, the non Greeks as well, just to have the encyclopedic uh, collection yeah. of this. But they were really really focused on the Hellenistic world. And so their the way they they worked on the text, the way they composed the texts, they looked at, they took all different t- manuscripts, different versions. Of Homer, of Hesiod, and others, right. and they they saw that there are conflicts between uh, there are contradictions, there are missing elements, there are th- different uh, uh, different problems, textual problems w- with these manuscripts, and they found a way to, to to harmonize them and correct these. So all the approach of how to work with texts, with complicated texts or problematic texts, they started doing that, and wow. they and and these same methodologies were then applied also by the Jews. To the uh, to so the sources even the that methodology we yeah, trace back exactly that is so that is so what do you think like two seventy around there around there yeah around and there then, that's but as a first layer yeah I mean of course it continued to be developed later right on. yes um, but uh, and, and in fact but but also kind of uh, we our the, our version of the Bible but the Torah as well of course um, that we know today 
uh, did not reach its um, more or less final form until the 10th century, 10th century of the Common AD, Era. Right. Leningrad Codex. Um, with, with the Masoretes. Yeah. yeah. And, and then uh, the Septuagint version, everyone thinks that's, oh, that's the one from 300 or 270 BC that Ptolemy? Nope. That's from 400s. Well, I mean, that's, that's the church manuscripts. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, the and it, even those manuscripts. get that We have earlier manuscripts, of course. Of sure, 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 sure. But only and those have Yao in it. Partially. Have you seen Some those? of them have, yeah. guys, of course. Yeah. So that's how you know they're changing stuff around because it's yeah. a church Bible. Why would you have Yao if you're worshiping the Lord? Yeah. Curios. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. But, anyways. So, um, yeah, things are history, actual history, real history is so much more fascinating. Then any corp, any single corpus can, 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 so like the Bible or others or Herodotus or whatever it is, any single corpus cannot reflect the, 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 the beauty and the richness in the, uh, of actual, you know, history. And the actual history, you really learn from primary sources written in real time by people who never thought anyone would de- read them, you know, 2,500 years yeah, later. Yeah. They wrote it for their own people at that time, Ostroka, letters, papyri, and all of that stuff. And when you read that, you ana- analyze that, you, uh, you compare it to what you would expect for that time period, you, you are now really op- you open up to, uh, to the full richness and beauty of actual real everyday life in antiquity, which is really the most beautiful and really most interesting um, aspect of, of what we do in our research. The book is out. Yaoism under the Achaemenid Empire. And that's exactly what we're discussing today. Um, this book was, was put together, edited by you with how many other scholars? Well, edited by me and Professor Reinhard Kratz from uh, Gottingen University. And um, we have 19 scholars uh, who co- contributed to, uh, to the book. So uh, I've been reading it, and it's every, every chapter or, or article that, if you, if you may, is something I've never heard or I'm learning new on. So it's really, really that groundbreaking. I wanted to discuss the origins of Yahweh, how far back Yahweh goes, even, even as far back as the, the, the so-called Shashu Yahweh inscription. That's one I've talked about on my channel. People who watch this know exactly what I mean. If not, we can give a, you can give a little rundown what this is. I want to ask you about that. Um, another thing I wanted to tie in and you can debunk it or whatever, however you want. You can explain the names of these Hyksos pharaohs that have Yah in it. Now, I asked you about this last night. We talked about it, and you made a, made a lot of sense of what you said. But some people, some people might be wondering. You have a, a pharaoh whose name looks like Yaakov, and then you have Yanasi, and you have all these Yah in the names, and everyone already thinks the Hyksos are related to the Israelites because Josephus thinks that, and they had an expulsion. So people try to equate that with the Exodus. We always discuss that's not this. It's not the same thing. It's not a one-to-one thing. It might be barely drawing from it, but it's the different thing. But the name Yah is there. So what's what's going on with that? And where is where does Yahweh come from? Right. So f- about the Hyksos, um, this is uh, it's really of- often hard to tell if the um, if the vowels Yah are really the name, if it's a theophoric name, yeah, or it's just the vowel. Um, yeah. And so we talked a little bit about we mentioned last night. Um, we talked about one name that we do know is Theophoric, um, and, and that's from a later period, and someone who is not um, from Judea or from Samaria or from the Northern Kingdom, so to speak, and other places, and that's Yaobidi. Yaobidi was a, um, a Hittite, and he was king of Hamat, and so Hamat is uh, Northern Syria of today, and uh, it's a uh, Aramean city. Yeah. And uh, so we have a Hittite king of an Aramean city, and his name has Yao in it. But we do know that in this case, this is a theophoric element in his name because it has the dinger, uh, like the, 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 the divine, the divine um, determinative uh, of the of the of the name. So we know that he was a Yaoist, uh, although he was a Hittite, right? So wow. I mean, what, what's that date for that? Uh, that's uh, 8th century, uh, 8th century uh, BCE. Tiglath Pileser III, uh, you know, uh, had problems with him. He revolted against Tiglath Pileser III, and so that's how hmm. his name was conserved because he, he appears, he in, appears in, that text. In, the, in, in the inscription. So, uh, but thankfully, it was conserved. So we know that, and we have other examples as well. 
but this is the most prominent one. And we know, therefore, that there were Yahwists who were not Judean, and they were not even Israelites. They were other Yahwists. So, the, so Yahwism is larger than just Judea and the Northern Kingdom. Yeah, and I look, I, so I was going down a rabbit hole by myself one time, looking at these Hexos names with the Yah in it, and I compared it to the Yahweh of the Shashu, and I'm trying to think, is this the same God or not? It's not. The names in the hieroglyphics don't match. The, the Yahs in the Hexos kings are Yah, which is like an Aleph mm-hmm. or Alpha. And the Yahweh of the Shashu has the, has a different symbol. If I can't really explain it. I'll show it on the screen while I'm talking about it. Yeah. But that's more of an H sound. Yeah. So they're not, and, and it turns out that Yah was a popular moon god of the Egyptians. It's very, so very it just yeah, happens absolutely. to line up. And it, you have to admit that's a cool coincidence. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, uh, it does sound like a coincidence and that's a, that's, it's a coincidence. I mean, uh, it's a very short, right? It's a very short element also. So it's not a, it's not like they had a nut, right? Or, right. or, or, or things like that. But about the, uh, the Shasu of Yahoo, um, they appear in two, uh, two temples that are in modern day Sudan. In Soleb and in Amara West, um, both of them are from uh, from Ramses, uh, from Ramses, yeah, Ramses the second, and um, and there it, they appear in the list of nations. Um, now, what's interesting about the exact spot in which they appear um, is that the uh, these are uh, different names of of deities. So, together with Anat, with Baal, uh, I, I think. The Anat part needs to be uh, uh, reconstructed. It's not. It's not fully preserved. But at least there are a number of of, of other deities Shasu of that deity, meaning that there is a possibility. I can't be absolutely sure, but there is a possibility that Yao here is also intended to be understood as if as one of these deities from that region. Again, I'm not. I can't vouch for that in 100 percent but this uh, there is a parallelism and there is something interesting about this that where we can we might be able to say that this is probably i mean possibly the uh, earliest record that we have for the name for yahweh. the yahweh yeah. yeah and not just the moon god but actual an actual deity named yahweh yeah, well, in parallel with anat and, and baal etc yes, yes so yeah and so that could be again i'm not saying that it's 100 percent sure but there is something about that these lists that uh, lends itself to uh, to a parallelism of deities in these names, so it could be part of that list of you know place names with or people uh, names with uh, with the uh, a divine component in it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you brought up the Hittite. Um, is he a prince? What's what is he? Well, he was king of Hamat. That's king. All we know him, about him. He wow. was the king of of Hamat. So he was a Hittite king of an Aramean city already is weird uh, or right. interesting at least it is very um, interesting and uh, so that's already something that is uh, well at least that is uh, that raises questions so he comes from further up north to the northwest you know the Hittite or Neo-Hittite empire there or region and then becomes somehow the king of this Aramean city which is a major city Hamat and somehow joins in with the rebellion against the Neo-Syrians and that's how we know about it uh, I'm sure yeah. there were others. I mean, uh, without a doubt, he was not the only one, because that would be really, really weird if there was only just one like that. But uh, chances are that there were more, but they were simply did not make it into the historical record. Yeah. Uh, this one did only because he rebelled. This is in the 8th century. Yahweh would already be around in Judea in that time period. Yeah. Do you, th- and is it your, to your understanding, obviously it's speculation, we don't know for sure, but do you think that Yahweh came from the Hittites? Towards the south or from the south to the north? Well, it's impossible to know for certain. We do know that there's a lot of documentation. I mean, a lot. There's significant documentation. This I call this particular one significant also. Uh, but uh, certainly we have this. Again, I think one thing we should already really recognize is there were Yahwists who are not from Judea or from Samaria, not from the so-called southern kingdom or the northern kingdom. So there are other Yahwists out there. I think that's a really important point. Right. Uh, because we usually think uh, that Yahwism uh, was just for the Judeans or just for the Sumerians or, or both. I mean, it is, you know, between these two, uh, these two regions and these two uh, kingdoms. And uh, it's not the case. That's not the case. The Yahwism was wider as, as a phenomenon. At the same time, 
Yaoism is relatively seems to be again. We, I, I always I'm always cautious because we simply don't have enough data from those periods to be absolutely certain about anything. I'm just pointing out the different data points that we have, some conclusions that we can probably kind of sketch out uh, from these data points, but uh, we have so little data to go on, we can't really reach uh, definitive conclusions, and that's fine. That's fine. I think that with um, archaeology now in the Middle East is slowly coming back, we might be able to find more documentation. I know in parts of Syria that are relatively safe, there is uh, there are archaeological um, excavations that are being 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 held, so and are finding really interesting stuff. Like I mean, in, in Iraq and Syria, like about the Mitanni, we won't go into that, but really interesting stuff. So we might be able to to um, and about the Hittites. In fact, a lot of, of work is being done about the Hittites now uh, in southern Turkey. Um, and uh, we might find additional information, different additional names that are Yahwistic names that will be able to uh, to allow us to be more uh, precise about dating uh, the phenomenon of Yaw of really early early Yahwism uh, to that region or not. I mean, but we do we certainly have that particular data point, which is significant. Again, a king of a, an Aramean city up way to the north. I mean, Hamat is. Um, is significantly uh, farther to the north uh, from from Israel, uh, from ancient Israel and from, from Judah, and um, and so um, yeah, there were Yahwists uh, to the, there were Aramean Yahwists uh, as well. Yeah. Um, so I would venture to say, I mean, there is a lot of uh, these questions, Yahweh, and and these are based on biblical material. I mean, Yahweh coming from Mount Seir, Mount Yahweh coming. Which, are, which exists in the Bible, right? Yahweh coming from Taman, from the south. Um, th these are quotes that are, that are in the Bible. I don't know how historical they are, right? Because they appear in a, in a kind of a, a poetic uh, context. Um, so we shouldn't a attach too much weight to these biblical quotes unless we have extra biblical data to corroborate it, okay? Yeah. What we do have, though, is extra biblical data that attaches it to the north, that attaches the origins of, of Yahwism and Yao uh, as such to the uh, to the Aramean really? Federation. Which always, just, I, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and I've always thought it was the South. It's no, it always been my impression that because of the Yahweh Shashu yeah, description. Well, I mean, Shashu, we don't know where they are, right? I mean, these are nomads. We don't really know. from the North. It could have. It, it, right. it makes so a lot some of sense. Some, I've, I've been, had people show me that some of the archaeology shows that these, these nomads living in Sinai, Slash, the Southern Levant actually had um, Aegean pottery. They could have came from the Aegean as well. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what uh, what uh, period you're talking about, but yeah, late I mean, Bronze Age. Uh, yeah, no. late Bronze Age. Yeah. Okay, so so again, the Bronze Age. I think we also mentioned that yesterday. The Bronze Age collapse really changed a lot yeah. in the area and caused a lot of uh, disconnect between what happened before the collapse and. You know, several centuries later on, and even that is much more complex than we imagined earlier. I mean, there were periods of uh, of greater prosperity and less prosperity in between, and periods where people started to write again, to express themselves in writing more. I mean, in the before the collapse, the Bronze Age was relatively speaking a very literate period. A lot of uh, good material was written at the time. The Amarna letters were written at that period in Palestine, in Jerusalem, for example, and other places. And so then, after the collapse, that kind of the record becomes much it's like a drier. Dark age. It's it's a, it's almost a dark age. Yeah, I mean, we can we can understand from different pieces and kind of pick, right. you know put it all together. Something. But it's it's uh, it's a much more uh, it's it's certainly a, a a much darker age. Yes. Um, and then we come we start kind of coming back to uh to more to a better documented documented uh, uh period in the in the record. So yeah, um, and that's where we start seeing, you know, Yellow Beauty, for example. So eighth century, right. late ninth century, things are starting to come back. I mean, in, in in a very clear way, and of course into the eighth century with the Neo Assyrians kind of uh, arriving on the scene. Wow. What about as far as in Judea itself, when you start seeing Yahweh show up there? Instead of the, we're talking about the outside areas, what, where do you start seeing? And then I know this Theophoric names is how you sort of look at this. Yeah. Yeah, the that's names. the best way. I want to. Yeah, let's get into the names. I know you mentioned there's sometimes there are Yo and Ya. What is what What is the reason for that? And where? What areas do we see Yo? What areas do we see Ya? What's the sort of divide with that? 
Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. There is a very clear, up until the, it's progressive, but it's up until the, the end of the 7th century, give or take, we really see a very clear difference in the naming scheme between, between the north and the south, so between Samaria area and Judea area. And so the Theophoric name in the south have Yahu with a Ha in the, in, in the middle, uh, a Ha sound, um, and the north only Yo. So like Yonatan, right? Or Yoel right. and like Yosef. Joel, or Yosef. Yosef. Yeah. yeah. Although Yosef, we do find it Yehosef and Yosef uh, in in different uh, much later on, but we do find that in the record from the fourth century on. We do find it. So that's that's a different uh, period, and I'll I'll explain why why that's important. But what's interesting, and I have an article on that about the identity, Yahwistic identity. The article is called Yahwistic identity in the Achaemenid period. Where I show, I mean, it's a lot of data. I show, it, I have tables with data in it, and that's really date kind of based on 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 archaeological data with names, with actual uh, findings, physical findings, primary sources. There was a clear name reform, which mm-hmm. is an identity reform. When when you reform reform your name, because you know names pass from father to son, you know, from grandfather to, and um, and they are really a, a, a very central part of a person's identity, certainly in, in antiquity. I mean, you inherit your father or your grandfather's name and you continue that, you know, that family tradition. So for you to decide to change your name and to change the way it's spelled out, uh, that's a reform. That's a conscious decision that is a reform of some kind. And we start seeing that around the beginning of the 6th century, so the seventh, end of the 7th yeah. into the 6th century, by the mid sixth century, there are practically no more Yo names, just oh, Yahoo names. So it just becomes Yah. So there was now in in that article, uh, my what my point is that there was some kind of name reform, which is a cultic reform. Yeah, you know, I mean the 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 theophoric element in the name is what changes. That's a big deal. And from that point on. All the names of all Yahwists, whether in, whether in Egypt or in Palestine or in Babylonia, they are all aligned with Yaho rather than Yo. From that point on, so you can see there is a clear cut period where the reform happened around the fall of the, fir- of the so-called first temple. That's interesting. Right around that time, huh? Right, right. Be- it started before though. Well, because you know, even the the, the, the first temple, the so-called first temple, I don't like the the, 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 the this uh, first temple. numbering uh, of temples is, is is also not very scientific. Because you know, just as a side note, I mean, um, there clearly was a temple in Jerusalem uh, already uh, before, already from the uh, El Amarna phase. So, what is the first? What is the second? Which number is Herod's temple? Is that the third or the fourth or whatever? So, you know, I'll use it for convenience. But what we call the first temple, before that, there were a lot of turmoil. Already in the end of the seventh century, of course, with the Carchemish, with the Babylonians coming in, and the tensions between Egypt and Babylonia in the area coming and going, and all of the campaigns that were happening between the Babylonians and the Egyptians back and forth at that time. So things were already very, very dangerous for the people living there, and I think that that contributed to this reform, the need to 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 look at um, trying to unify the names, trying to unify the Yaoists' yeah. identity. What do you think was the difference between between, between why, the two? why are some called Yo and some called Ya? So before the reform, yeah. what was the difference? Um, well, I mean, the Northern Kingdom, the Northern what's called Israel, and it is called Israel also in the Neo Assyrian. I mean, it's called Sari El, called Israel in the Neo Assyrian um, sources as well. Uh, it's called Kur Israel, which means the land of Israel, but the People governing it are the, are the house of Omri. Um, so it's not Israelites, but it's the land called the land. Called oh, you think Sorry, Omri has something to do with Yo and his name or no? No, no, okay. no, no, no. Is there any inscriptions of Yahweh spelled Yo way or anything like that? Like that's really off the top of my head. I don't know of any off the top of my head. There might be, but I don't. I don't know. I can't point you to any specific inscription. But I think the, the clearly. Up to the uh, up to the uh, late eighth century, the northern kingdom was the the more the more powerful one by far, and um, and yeah, and they 
they had their own way of uh, of, of addressing their deity. It was you. In both cases, I think it, it might have been for a chant, maybe some sort of. There's yeah, we can we can speculate. Right. There's no, but uh, we, don't, we it, just don't know. It right? might simply be a dialectical. That's more. That makes more sense. It's a dialectical difference between the north and the south. And and we know that there were dialectical differences between the north and the south, and it's norm, absolutely normal. Yeah. So they reflected the northern dialect. These guys reflected the southern dialect. Now the thing is, after Israel was, I mean, the this Samaria was run over by the neo Assyrians. So after the exile, what's called the exile of the twelve tribes. It's you know we won't, right. we won't get into that. <laughs> but the exile of the of, the, of Samaria by the neo Assyrians, and uh, after that. A lot of northern, so the Sumerians, again, it, these are not Samaritans, these are Sumerians, so people from Samaria. We don't call them Samaritans up until much later on oh, when really? there is the kind of the split I didn't know that. Between, between the Judeans and the Sumerians. So from the people from Samaria migrated into, into Judea after the, um, the destruction that the new Assyrian brought into the area. They just migrated down to the south. How many that's debated in how many people actually migrated, how many people were exiled, how many people went elsewhere. That's debated. Some scholars say that the amount is quite significant of people who came down, and that it impacted impacted just the history of the of the Judeans. It, it had it added people who are actually more literate yeah. uh, to to Judea. They brought with them capabilities that were rare uh, in in Judea. We find now in that period in the seventh century. We find people with Yo names, so people who are, who are probably or associate with or actually came from the north in Lachish, in different places, really strategic places, occupying, and we have bully, we have seals with these names. Mm -hmm. So people who are high ranking uh, with Yo names in the seventh century, not a lot, very few, in, but we do find them in Judea. So people from the north in Judea occupying high, um, high High positions, but again, fifth century. What's really interesting, sixth century, that vanishes. It's a, it's pretty incredible. Uh, so, if yeah. you look at the data in my article, it's re, it's really the data is so compelling. You see how yeah, I saw it that. absolutely changes, and that reform is a name reform. I'm not saying it's a, it's a, it is a form of cultic reform. I mean, it right. is not a, it's not just a name reform. It's the name of the of the element, uh, of the uh, of the theophoric element in the name. So it is a cultic reform of some sort. But I don't think it, it went beyond just the name. It doesn't, it, it's not new uh, ways of, of worshipping Yahweh. It's just the name reform. What it caused, though, which is really interesting, is a uh, ethno-religious group that transcends boundaries. So the people had the same identity be because of the name reform. People express the same identity whether they were in Babylonia, in Palestine, or in Egypt, or wherever they were. They had the same name. Do you think this is when the Yahwism starts to come together? Yes, this is cult. absolutely. This is when the sixth identity, six, mid sixth century and in, in the fifth, it's absolutely, uh, okay. absolutely clear. Although there is one exception in a Telephantine that still has Yo in it. Really? Yeah, but that's the exception that makes the rule, right? Yeah. So the reform clearly created a unified ethno-religious identity, which is, I mean, usually we say, when we talk about Yahwists, we say, well, that's the cult or the religion. Some of us say, well, it's the Judeans and the Sumerians, which is also true. But here, what we see is that there was, it, it, there was an identity that transcends political boundaries or administrative boundaries of Judea or Samaria, right? We have, the, there was a conscious effort to, to have a unified identity across the board. I think that's, that is extremely important to realize that there was already, it's not, it, a lot of people in, 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 in research say, well, these are Judeans and also the people of the Elephantine, they are Judeans. And, and, and that's, I think that's, that's absolutely wrong. Uh, there was already a, an ethno religious identity that, that transcends the borders. Uh, and that's significant. It is very significant yeah. because that, you know, that's the religion that, sort of finds its way into what we call Judaism. It sort of has its roots in the Yahwism. And you're talking in the 6th century at this time period. That's when they start to come together and start to formalize. Um, or, or Yeah, I mean, it was, as I said, it was, a, it was a progressive phenomenon. It started in the middle of the 7th century. 
and it, it became absolute in the middle of the sixth century. And I think it's, it is a reaction. It is a reaction to everything that they had to endure with the Neo Assyrians into the Neo Babylonian occupation. That was that period of constant struggle with the occupying forces and having to, um, and having also to, to migrate to your brothers in the South, for example. All of that seems to have created the notion amongst these different Yahoo, Yahoo worshiping people, uh, ethnic groups, that they have to come together and they have to standardize. That's probably, but again, this is obviously speculation, but that's probably what actually happened. So they, they standardized on the name, uh, on the theophoric element in the name, and that became absolute all, all over the place. Again, Babylonia, Samaria, Judea, Egypt, all the names have the same exact formula. That is a massive and, and, and previously unrecognized event in the history of Yahwism and ultimately the history of the Jewish people. Okay, that is fascinating. You mentioned before we talked about this, how the theophoric names of characters in the Bible is non-existent until what, what time period we start seeing these names? Well, not, not, it's not about the theophoric element. It's just it's the, the names uh, of people in the Bible. I mean. Names of literary yeah. heroes, not in gods. The Bible. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, but I so, so the names of 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 literary heroes like Abraham, Moses, Aaron, even Sarah, Rachel, Joseph, Levi, all of these names. So all the names of you know heroes, literary heroes from the Bible, are completely non-existent up until the end, the very end of the fourth century uh, before the Common Era really into the third century before the coming. These names are are non existent in the in, in the record at all. These names are not names that are found in the lists of names or any document uh, that we have uh, that, that we have from that period. It, it, the, there was no knowledge of these names. Uh, it was not there was no you know widespread knowledge of these names. They were not given to to uh, uh, to children when they were uh, they were born. Now, we have to be very cautious about this. The question, of course, is, well, was, was naming children after literary heroes something that was done in antiquity? I'd say, yeah. And uh, yes, and no. I mean, okay. yes, but of course, it depends, of course, on when. Obviously, in periods where there was actual literature. Right. right? So in the Greek world, um, you see a lot of In Greek the Greek world, you see it. Dionysius is absolutely all in the Greek world. Names, in the Greek world. Ap Apollonius, all these type of, yeah. Yeah. In the Greek world, you see it. In the Iranian world, you see it. In the Indo Iranian world, you see it. Uh, a little bit also in the Egyptian world. So you see, you, you do see that in, in certain cultures, and it makes a lot of sense as well. In the um, Yahwistic slash Jewish sphere, you don't really see that with an asterisk. I, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that, but you don't really see that until the the fourth cent end of the fourth into the third century before the Common Era. Uh, the asterisk that I had is about Achikar. So Achikar was a very very popular um, work. Achikar was this really that's it's, a, it's the first international bestseller, really. It is a very compelling story about, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into the details, but about a person called Achikar and, and his uh, adventures and uh, under the Neo-Assyrians, actually. And it also has a section of just wisdom sayings that were very, very popular. So this entire work, uh, the wisdom of Achikar, was very, very popular in antiquity, yeah. uh, certainly in the 6th century into the, the 5th century. We have a copy of, um, a, you know, a very fragmentary copy of this in Etalafatine. Uh, so it was, they had that as well. And we do see among the, uh, the Yahwists and in, at least in Babylonia, we see Yahwists uh, taking on the name Achikar. So that might be, again, I need to be very cautious about this as well, but that might be, that might indicate that they did start naming their children after that literary hero, not biblical literary heroes, but after Achikar, which was a, a you know, literary work that they were familiar with. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if that's the when, case, when was that again? Uh, sixth century, late sixth century into the fifth uh, century. So that's um, right in the middle of that period where you start to see this other that's right. as well. That's right. But that looks like they started naming their children after that particular literary hero in Babylonia, where that story was very um, in Achikar, where that story was very popular. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, it was again. This story was 
a massive bestseller, really, in the uh, seller. I mean, they didn't sell it, but it was very popular as a as a work, uh, a literary work in antiquity, and and continued to be very popular way into the Middle Ages, really. Uh, it's, it's, it is an, a fascinating story, and I really recommend that people look it up and and and, and check it out. Uh, there are di- many different versions uh, or editions of it, translated to a lot of different languages. So it was popular among the Jews. Clearly, we we do find it at Elephantine. Yeah. So they didn't have a copy of anything biblical, but they did have a copy of this. Now that's interesting because okay. they they're bringing culture with them to Elephantine. Right. Just not the Bible. Just not the Bible. Yeah, that's right. Now, obviously, we talk about Elephantine a lot. Yeah. But I do I still, before I get there, I mean, we could get into um, what do we find in Elephantine that is is sort of um, striking things that really kind of throw a wrench in who we th- what we think about Yahweh in general. Or we can, another thing I wanted to ask you about is what is the culture like in the Persian period in, in Judea too, both cities? I kind of want to know about both. So about Elephantine and about yeah, whichever one you want to take first. Sure. I mean, uh, wow, that, these are huge. I know. Uh, areas whichever, one. whichever one you think is the most um, compelling. Well, Elephantine is okay. the most is the best documented. Right? Let's do that we one. have very little documentation in Judea or Samaria, uh, at least textual documentation. I mean, little documentation in, of all of all sorts. We do have in Judea and Samaria, just as a side note, um, um, pictorial. I mean, like coins, bully, and things like that. That's so one. That's, of, that's interesting. That's it very says a lot about them. Yeah, and that says a lot about them, and that's how we do know. I mean, what we do know, we have almost no textual data from Judea and Samaria. But uh, or I mean, if you if you look at the bully and the little text that is there, uh, but really we have uh, we have very little textual data from from these regions. What we do have is from Elephantine and uh, from from Egypt in general. Most of it is in Elephantine, not just Elephantine, but ninety somewhat percent of it is yeah. from Elephantine. And there, what we do we we have is a lot of, um, I mean, a very wide range of documentation. Yeah, they're very literate. Very, very, very literate. Yeah. Uh, men and women. Wow, are literate. And the women are very powerful there as well in at Elephantine, especially one who is is really my favorite, uh, Miftahia. And she, uh, she's a very powerful woman. She uh, apparently was very, uh, very uh, attractive and also very strong-willed, and very, and just really knew how to uh, to take care of herself. And t- talking about politically and just not, not to establish her her position. I mean, she would divorce. She divorced her husband. I mean, she had more. <laughs> they didn't do it. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, she decided that she had enough. <laughs> um, and that's that's you know that's fifth cent- that's fifth century before the Common Era. So right. she was she was a pretty uh, a very impressive figure at Elephantine. Uh, there are other women that have very interesting stories. I, I, I won't get, get into that right now. But yeah, the, uh, the the community at Elephantine is a fascinating fascinating study um, of of Yahwists. Do they write about um, their past? Coming from Israel, do they ever talk about that? What do they say about that? They don't talk about coming from anywhere, but they do talk about coming from somewhere. Right. They don't mention it. They don't mention where, unfortunately. But they do say when our fathers came here. That's yeah. that's what I you get that text. And that and and they they do say that he was under the site Pharaoh. So before the Persian context uh, conquest, we're talking about the twenty sixth dynasty of Egypt. Uh, the site pharaohs from Sais, from the from the city called Sais, uh, yeah, Sais. in Lower Egypt. So there are scholars who say that they might they might have come with the Persians. I think that ho- that doesn't hold any water at all. I mean, it's, it's absolutely not convincing. They, to me, uh, looking at all the sources, uh, it's pretty clear that they uh, that they came before the Persian conquest uh, as mercenaries or something that the Egyptians. Uh, wanted to bring to uh, to what was at, at at times the southern border of the Egyptian uh, the Egyptian kingdom. Uh, when I say at times, it wasn't always the, the southern border. Yeah. Sometimes this we're talking about the first cataract of the Nile, um, and the and, and at times the uh, the border extended out to the second cataract of the Nile, which today is submerged under Lake Nasser in, the, oh, in wow. Egypt. But the first cataract is, is of course, still uh, still very much uh, there and active. That was, but that was in many ways either actually or or even conceptually the southern border of of Egypt. Yeah. When I say conceptually, the the deities that were associated with that island are deities that are Nubian that are yeah, facing yeah. you know so so these are deities that are clearly designed to be 
protecting and facing to the south, like Satet and Anuket. Uh, these are uh, female deities that are that are associated with Elephantine, mm-hmm. and of course Hnum, who eventually became yeah the main yeah, deity there. In some texts, or maybe just the one I saw, but it might be more than one. One of them I know for sure. Uh, it was in your book mentioned actually. One of one of the articles in your book mentioned that Kanum and Yao are side by side. Uh, in the name of Kanum and Yao, that's right. something like that. That's right. That's interesting. That's right. That's that's absolutely well. It's interesting for us today. Yeah, well, that's because absolutely normal for, for antiquity to bless people by more than one deity in the name of the gods. That's, right? that's absolutely. But those two seem to be like very high up. Well, I mean, yeah, and, and it's interesting because there was clearly, to my mind at least, some some relationship. Between Knum and Yahweh in the minds of of the Egyptians, or at least in the minds of the Jews or the Yahwehs who came down uh, to Upper Egypt, to to the um, to the first cataract uh, region. And the reason I say that is that the temple to Yao, which was constructed at Elephantine, literally, and I've been there. It was, it's literally like you know two yards away from, or two three yards away maximum. From the Knum Temple, the, the really? priests are right next I to mean, each other. Right next to one, almost touching. Okay, like that's all you only see that in, in like Rome, where they have like ISIS Temple right next to Saturn or something. Yeah, but these are this is how they're doing temple, it. But yeah. now this is one is a Knum Temple, and the other one is a Yao Temple. Completely. Do you, do you think I was told from people that they competed with each other? But maybe there was more overlap than we yeah, think. Yeah, there was. Uh, so I mean, the very fact that the site. Authorities, so the site uh, pharaohs, allowed the Yahwists to construct a temple right next to the Knum temple, and only them. No Nabu, the Nabu temples and other temples were in Aswan, not in at the Elephantine. That is striking. Yeah. Now, so so people understand just how striking that is. Elephantine Island was. By the time the Yahwists came in the middle of the 6th century before the Common Era, Elephantine was already a major cultic site for millennia before that. Literally, thousands of years of where Elephantine was a, a very, an extremely important cultic island with theological importance. And the importance of that is that they believed that the waters, because it's the first cataract, right? That's where the, 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 the waters become impossible to, to navigate. Because it's the first cataract, they believe that the annual flood, flooding of the Nile, came from two caves that are under Elephantine Island. So once a year... Sirius star the, rises. Yeah, and the... the, 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 the uh, dog star. The, uh, the, yeah, and the, uh, so the waters come out and, and flood. Now this impacts the economy of the of all of Egypt, right? right? The entire so it's the most important so, time of the year. Well, yeah, but I mean the cult of Elephantine, what people do, how they appease the gods, how they please the, the deities there, that can impact life and death for 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 all of Egypt, right? They're in a now, tough the, spot. The, now the the fact that the Egyptians allowed a temple to a Levantine deity to be constructed right next to Knum, to my mind, uh, uh, shows that they probably had some kind of assimilation yeah. already that was accepted by the Egyptians by as the well. Egyptians, right? Not just by the Alice. That's significant. Because otherwise, how would you allow this temple to be constructed on such a, a critical area, I mean, such a critical location on the Nile that can r- literally d- d- determine life and death? So again, we this has to be speculation. We don't have any document that says that there is no. But I mean, the very the, the question of why allow a temple to this Levantine, mi- relatively minor Levantine deity, to to be constructed on the island, right, literally touching the Knum Temple precinct, that's a big question. And I think the only reason, the only the only logical. Uh, explanation was that there was some kind of understanding. Well, and that text that that was translated from from one of the scholars that you work with sort of almost proves that they were sort of connected in a sense where you're literally invoking two gods together to bless somebody. Right. 
So like you wouldn't do that if they were opposing gods. You would, you know. No, no, absolutely. But then uh, something happened after 420 or 419 uh, before the com- the common era, and there was a figure coming that came to Egypt called Hananiah. A very important figure. I can talk. You can have the entire discussion just on this one. Uh, we won't get into that. But uh, he came down to uh, to Egypt, and about ten years after he came to Egypt, we have a letter that uh, a group of the Yaw- of these Yahwehs from Elephantine writes. Right, they were outside of. They were out somewhere in Edfu or, or something like that. So to the north of Elephantine, they are writing to their brethren at Elephantines, telling to, uh, telling them that Knum has been against them since Hananiah has been to Egypt. And this is where the division starts. Well, this is where, so probably when Hananiah came, the division started. So the, uh, the uh, distancing themselves from Knum and, and, and going down the route, the other, um, other route, which we don't know. I mean, it's certainly not monotheistic. They continue to be, uh, to, to not be monotheistic. And again, there's no monotheism at that period at all. Um, but, uh, they, they were less about Knum and more about Levantine deities. Uh, so from that period, we see other deities come into the, into the, uh, into focus. Uh, and these are Anat Betel, Betel, a lot of Betel names, a lot, I mean, not a lot, but a few Betel names, Anat names, Eshem. Other other deities that are uh, that are, but they are Levantine. There are no more. There are not Egyptian names uh, at that point. And so, and what's really interesting though is at the very end of the document records, or around 400, uh, around the year 400 uh, before the Common Era. That's in the that at, at the heart of the rebellion, the successful rebellion of the Egyptians against the Persians. So the first uh, Persian occupation, the end of the first. Persian occupation of Egypt, they will, they will govern Egypt again for a short period of time later on in the, in the, in the fourth century. But the very end of the, um, of the, uh, uh, first Persian occupation came to a close around that time. And we have a very important document there where Yah, Yao, Yao is mentioned, uh, it receives uh, contributions, monetary, I mean, like, uh, m- money from the community, the Yahwista community of the island. And the money is given to Yao, but also to Anat Betel and Eshem Betel. Mm. So there is a triad. Wow. Uh, that's at the end of All the... All the Trinitarians walked in and were like, yes! Well, this <laughs> is a triad. It's not Trinity. Right, right, There's right. a difference. Yeah. But it's uh, but there is a triad at the very end. So this is really... Triads are very of, common, too. And triads are extremely Especially common. Especially in the Greek world. We've seen everywhere. Greek world, Egyptian world, uh, everywhere. I mean, that, that triad uh, is, 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 is significant in, in the Egyptian... In the Egyptian language, I mean, the Egyptian psyche, three just means uh, uh, a lot, means, means plural. Right. Uh, so when you have, like, in the Egyptian language, if you write, if you have a noun and, uh, and then you put three, three lines after it, it just means that noun in, is, is now plural. Right. 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 So three just so means, means, means a lot. Yeah. Right. And so, so triads are extremely, uh, extremely popular in Egypt. Actually, the Enneads, nine were even more Enead, popular. Yeah. But, uh, but triads are extremely important. And, uh, and, and very, and practically every, every culture had some, some kind of triad. Yeah. In my article, I even mentioned a, a, a possible triad that was preserved in the Bible itself as well. Oh. But that's, that, that's, uh, um, you know, arguable. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe it is a triad, but people, you know, there are people, of course, who disagree, yeah, like, yeah. like anything else. Yeah. So we have what, at the beginning of the document record at Elephantine, we have is it the same time that papi- the Passover papyrus, Passover, papyrus. the so-called Passover papyrus, yeah. so-called Passover papyrus is from 419. Yeah, um, right. And, and that's the one that was written by Hananiah. Oh, it's uh, that's who wrote it. That's who wrote it. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So We're that's talking the, about the same person here. Yeah. And this, I wanted to highlight. We talked about this a little bit, but we didn't get too much into it. There is back and forth conversation going on between the the Yahwists in Judea and Jerusalem. And then the ones that are still in Elephantine in the fifth century, um, all the way throughout the first fifth century. Um, what can we gather from those correspondences? Obviously, the big ones, the Passover one. If you want to discuss that, well, the the so called Passover letter, which I is not, it's a term that I'm trying to move. Away yeah, 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 yeah. From, but that's a this is the name of it. Yeah, and it might stick, but it might not. I, I hope it won't. But, but I think uh, people realize now to be. 
I think you did this. I think most people are not saying, even though they call it the Passover letter, they're not saying. We just it. say the so-called Passover. Letter. So, yeah, so we'll stick with that. Yeah, yeah. But the um, <laughs> but, but what can we do, really? Right. So that particular one, we have. We, it's not really the authorities from Judea per se. It's really one person, Hananiah, who came into Egypt. Now, this Hananiah was a very, very authoritative figure. Mm-hmm. I mean, he commanded the the Awista community at Elephantine to do something, to observe something. He had. Did he know Cy- or Darius by like? Do they know each other? Or was this my analysis would suggest that he did know Cy- uh, Darius the second, not Darius the first, but Darius the second, of course, a hundred years yeah. uh, later on. But Darius, he, I think he did not. He did know. Wow. Uh, because because I identify. So this is my theory, and I, you know, I, I, I I'm, I'm coming out with um, with an article uh, showing that. But uh, but basically, I think he was a Sumerian aristocrat. The difference between Judea and Samaria. Was that um, in Judea the governors were appointed, and in Samaria they were inherited. So there was it was aristocratic in Samaria, father to son, and in Judea it was not aristocratic. It was appointed uh, governors. Now in the Persian world, in the uh, Achaemenid world, uh, ar- aristocracy was taken very very seriously, and so people, you know, the, the aristocrats were 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 sent to the to the palace in Susa or wherever it was, wherever. and and grew up in the palace and, and learned how to uh, how to lead and how to yeah, become how to good, good subjects of the Achaemenid of the Achaemenid Empire, and he probably followed that curriculum. Right. Okay? And so, if that's the case, he was at the palace. He would have known, of course, Darius the um, Second. So he might have been educated in the top philosophy yeah, of the day. Yeah, I mean, they were they were educated in, of course, in fighting techniques, and they were in hunting. And also writing and, 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 and things like that. So yeah. according to my analysis, he was, and I won't, don't want to get too much into the details because we can spend an hour just on Hananiah. I think really that he is one of the most fascinating figures of that period. He's possible to be a Magus or no? No, 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 no. Okay. No. But he was, he was a Yaoist. He was a very, a very, you know, kind of staunch Yaoist. Uh, he was, he was a religious figure, so to speak. And that's why he commanded the, 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 the community at Elephantine. To observe something, uh, it's not a Passover, but some observance, and um, and, and and wrote a letter that actually command. But it, what's interesting is that he not only did that, but he also uh, so after he came, so after four nineteen when he came, or arrives in Egypt, things started to be problematic for the Yahwistic uh, community. Before that, they really had no problems with their um, no document problems, at least with their with their neighbors. After that, they started to be persecuted. And they were thrown in jail. Some of them were even thrown in, uh, in jail in Edfu and other places. Uh, they started really having some problems. And so this guy sends his slaves, two of his slaves, to negotiate with the local governor for their release. Wow. Now think about the authority here. Yeah. He is not, he won't even go down himself to talk to the governor. Yeah. So Egypt, just to, so people know, um, in the Achaemenid Empire, under the king you had satraps, yeah. who were kind of almost kings of regions. Okay, so they're right. kind of sub kings. They're not governors. They're above the governors, but below the king. So these are satraps, and they govern areas that have provinces in them, and these provinces are governed by by governors, right? Yeah. So like um, Judea, Samaria were provinces of Eber Nahari, the uh, the satrapy. The fifth satrap. Uh, so the governor that was that 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 kind of uh, uh, threw them in jail, uh, the, the Yaoists that I was talking about, was the governor of Upper Egypt called Widranga. That was his name. And Hananiah doesn't even bother going down himself to negotiate for the for the release of his kinsmen. Right. He sends his slaves to do it, and he's successful at doing it. They negotiate, and they are able to release. Uh, to release the uh, the Yaoists from jail, and they are able, and then they they are on their way to Elephantine. We do have a letter, uh, that letter that says that that uh, Khnum has been against them since Hananiah has been in Egypt. That letter also tells the people at Elephantine to prepare to receive these servants, these slaves of Hananiah, with royal uh, royal reception. I mean, just just going all out 
to receive them with the uh, with the the, the greatest honors. Wow. So Hananiah was clearly incredibly powerful. Yeah. I mean, you know, between the the satrap and the um and the governors, there's a void, right? There's nothing between governor satrap, right? So this guy gets no credit in print chronicles and kings or any of these. No, of course no, not. Of course not. No, 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 no. Um, interesting. And so, according to my, again, I, I don't want to get too much into this because it'll, if I do open this up, it'll require. But the, uh, but according to my analysis, this man Hanania lived a long life. He he failed in Egypt ultimately because of the rebellion and because the Egyptians basically drove out the uh, the Persians. But he became the governor of Samaria. Yeah, uh, in the first half of the uh, of the fourth century. So that I won't get too much into the, de- the details. But this is an extremely important character historically. He is a very powerful man who that who impacted in many many different ways. Uh, impacted the the history of not just the people in 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 in, in, in Egypt, but also Jewish history in general. Uh, very deeply impacted. So that's that's this person called Hanania. That's very fascinating. Yeah. Now. They start getting in trouble in Elephantine. There is a source from Tacitus, and I think he cites Hecateus, actually. He talks about an exodus, but it's not the exodus from the Bible. It's some, he has a date. Mm-hmm. He says, under King Bacchus, the Jews were, under the derision of the god Amon, that's another horn god, decided that the Jews were the problem and that they were, because of Something they were doing, they were causing famines and all this, whatever, whatever they get blamed, and they get kicked out. And this is the, the to me, I think the date lines up to this being like fifth or sixth century BCE. Is this plausible? Are they talking about Elephantine? What is maybe, or is he getting it wrong? Well, I mean, that? what we do have is under uh, Cambyses and Darius the first, there was an Egyptian character, very also very very important Egyptian person. Uh, called Uja Horesnet. He was a physician and a general and, I mean, a very... Polymath. Polymath, also undoubtedly very, very charismatic and yeah. very influential. And he was... He uh, collaborated... I don't, I'm not using that term co- uh, pejoratively, but he collaborated with uh, with the Persians, uh, with um, with Cambyses and later on with uh, Darius I. And we have a um, Naophorus statue of him. So Naophorus meaning that he's holding a temple, kind of a, a box, and uh, and there's a hieroglyphs all over. Uh, I think it's yeah, it's in the Louvre. On the Naophorus statue of him, he talked. He describes what he did for the kings, what he and, and a little bit about the uh, the history of his time. And he talks about. Uh, bringing to the attention of the Achaemenid kings the, the necessity of driving out from Egypt some of the foreigners who are attached to the temples in Egypt. So that might have been that might have been the nucleus of of that story. So the idea that that the foreigners need to be driven out might be uh, related to Ujahoresnet, um and his idea of driving out the uh, the foreigners. We don't see the Jews being or the Yahwehs being thrown out uh, at any point. They, even after Elephantine, we very all, all, a few decades later on, we, we find Yahwehs in Edfo, mm, at Edfo, right around there, and in other places as well. In there was a in the Fayum. Fayum is a beautiful uh, oasis yeah, uh, yeah. to the west of the Nile, in upper, to, in upper Egypt, and uh, we find Yahwehs. Owning land and living there, wow. and in Edfu, in Edfu, we actually find find Yahwehs that sign in, in when they sign contracts, when they sign their profession, they say Kahana, which means priest. Hmm. Uh, and if they, if they sign the profession, their active profession as priest, there was probably a temple yeah. at Edfu as well. Right. Yeah. So we so the Jews weren't driven out really uh, at, at at these uh, junctures. Seems to be sort of a rumor and fast this is coming. Well, Tacitus, I mean, that might be again, back a reference to, reference back to Ujaho Resnets and, and also like all telephone, time, things get changed up. All, all yeah. the time. I mean, yeah. Herodotus is, of course, a, he's living at this time period too. Yeah. Fifth exactly. century. Basically. Exactly. And he is, he also visits Elephantine. Right. He mentioned and, Elephantine. And yeah. he, he visits Elephantine. He mentions it. In, you know, Book he describes one, I think, right? Book one or two. One of the early ones. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and he talks about the people there as Persians. He doesn't talk about right, Jews. Right, he doesn't right. talk about others. He's just, all of them are Persians. Persians, Persians. But that, they do, uh, the Greeks do that with the Assyrians. They call 
Either it's Assyrians or Syrians. They're all Syrians. Yeah. They just say Syrioi. That's, that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. So. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so this back to the community of Elephantine, the, um, they're living in a very complex historical context from the 420s, uh, when Hananiah comes in, major shift for them. We see it in the names again with, with, uh, elements like, uh, like uh, Bethel and, um, yeah. and others. They themselves report that from that point, Hanum is against them. Not the priests of Hanum, but the, Hanum, God, the, the, the deities. That's what, that's why it reminded me of the test yeah. first. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's also significant. There was some, at least local reform that happened in around the 420s, wow. uh, 419, excuse me, um, and, and, and forward. That impacted, that impacted the community deeply. Um, things have really started changing from that point uh, forward. But again, at the end, you have, you have this triad of Yahu, Eshim Betel, and Anat Betel. Again, it, but it's a triad of Yahu with Levantine deities, not with, not with Egyptian deities. Now, at Elephantine, you had the triad of Knum, Satet, and Anuket. Okay, Knum and his wife and his daughter. My analysis in a different article suggests that what the, what the Yahweh did was to replicate that, but a three-way replication, because what they did, for, uh, around 404, at, you know, 404 before the Common Era, in the Achaemenid Empire, there was a new king, uh, Artaxerxes II, who reigned for a long time. He reformed the Achaemenid cult, which before him was very much Ahura Mazda focused, mm -hmm. and he introduced a triad. So yes, yeah, so Artaxerxes II introduces the triad. So now it's not just Ahura Mazda, but it's Ahura Mazda Mitra, Mitra, and Anahita, and Anahita the goddess. So that's yeah. right. That's Actually, right. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so uh, I think, in, in according to my analysis, again in the article that I published on this, which I call the Interpretatio Judaica. Um, and so that, in that article, I, sh I, I show, or at least I try to show that, um, that what they did is to reflect both the Egyptian triad and the Achaemenid triad at the same time, because both are, both are applicable to that time period, about around 400. Artaxerxes introduces the triad uh, around 404, uh, before the common era. And it seems like that triad, although it wasn't formally introduced, was already part of his father's cultic vision. Yeah. Uh, so Art Darius II's uh, cultic vision, because, and the reason I say that is because, according to certain sources, we know that when he when he ascended the throne, Artaxerxes II, there was already a goddess at that location, the statue of the goddess, probably Anahita. So that means that uh, that the cult of Anahita became standardized and kind of institutionalized before, even before. Artaxerxes the second uh, ascended the throne, so it, it looks like it might have uh, might have already the the, the the idea of a triad might have already entered the Achaemenid cultic sphere uh, even before. Do you think there's anything like that in Judea with with um what's her name Asherah or anyone else? Yeah, <laughs> who knows? El we Asherah, we, Yahweh, we, maybe. No. Well, <laughs> we have we have uh, Yahweh and uh, Shaddai and Elion. There you go. We do have that. And there's Asherah too, right? That's not related to Asherah. I mean, that okay. I don't. I don't know if any triad, yeah, 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 Asherah yeah. triad, but she's just around that. But yeah, yeah, she's always, of course, around. But the uh, but it, as a triad, which is in Psalm ninety one, you're talking about. Yeah, that's okay. that. It's, it's at the very beginning. There's a, there. There is a. I mean, just looking at the at the uh, at the at the um, parallelism in the first couple of verses. Uh, or the, even just the, one, the first verse, it, there is a parallelism between Elion, Shaddai, and Yahweh, and so very. And I'm not the first one to suggest that this is a, this is a triad. And I, actually, Rab, Rabbi uh, Julian Morgenstern suggested that already in the wow. 1940s. So that's that might be a triad that that, that was that was still kept in the biblical record um, somehow. That reminds me. Because we, you and I were discussing in one of the authors of, in, in this great book right here, Yahwism Under the Achaemenid Empire, um, talks about in Elephantine, there appears to be what looks like something that has not what she said, has knowledge of the Psalms. You and I don't think because the, the, the text that she's referring to in Elephantine is polytheistic by its nature. We, you and I think it's more likely that the Psalms know about this text. So let me let me correct what you just said. Okay. Uh, first of all, it's not Elephantine. 
So oh. you're, ta- you're talking about Pyrus Amherst 64. Amherst, yeah, okay, that's right, that's right. And the any relation to Elephantine, I mean, it might have some relation, and uh, Professor Tony Holm, who did an incredible job on 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 uh, kind of republishing this incredible, very long, very I mean, massive papyrus. So she's republishing. It's not out yet, but she's she's worked on it for for a long time, and she's really, uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, the authority on on this on this document. And so this document has we can talk about a lot of different aspects of this document that are important. But what you're referring to is a portion of that. It, it's I mean, it's basically an anthology of hymns. That was found somewhere. It's not provenance. It was sold in the anti- on the antiquities market in the in the nineteen hundreds in the nineteenth century. So it, we don't know where it was found. There are different uh, theories. Uh, probably somewhere in Thebes, in in, in a, somehow. But it, it does. So the, this anthology of hymns includes a hymn that is very much like Psalm twenty, hmm. uh, very reminiscent of Psalm twenty. Uh, it's shorter. And it is uh, so-called polytheistic, another term that I'm not particularly fond of, but, but it's, it, it has several deities involved in it. And um, I, some scholars, uh, uh, Tony Holm, uh, Professor Holm included, believe that this is, um, I, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but, but, she, but from my understanding, she sees it as, um, knowledge as, as something, sum. knowledge actually yeah. having potentially knowledge of the sum. I think she's more reserved on, on this point, sure, sure. giving this as an option. Um, but I think that um, Psalm 20, it looks like uh, Psalm 20 is, is, a, is an enhancement, kind of an amplification of, uh, of this psalm. And this, this hymn is an Aramean hymn that was, that was, I think, maybe very popular in the region. Sure. And Psalm, uh, what the version of it that, that we, we, we've, we know from Psalm 20 in in the Hebrew Bible, was a variant of this that the um, that that removed these other deities uh, from sense. it uh, from it and, and adapted it to its audience. Yeah, but I'm spe- just like um, her. I'm I'm speculating sure, as well. Sure. Um, but um, but yeah, it's, I just think it's, it's very- more it's more likely that you would take a text that's polytheistic, and if you're adding it to a collection of psalms that are already worshiping this one God, you would sort of change it into a more monotheist, monotheistic, monistic, um, or hemotheistic, whatever you want to call it. You would it, it looks more likely that you go in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, it's important also to note that uh, that's I, I agree with you on this particular in this particular case, for a lot of scholars and a lot of lay people, monotheism is an evolutionary step after polytheism, right? So not necessarily. Mean. And I, I always stress this that all religions Practically all cults of systems you have some sort of vacillate between being periods and locations well, where they might be more monist yeah. and, and or more poly. I'll give you a prime and, example: the yeah. Rig Veda, which everyone thinks that Hinduism is the most polytheistic religion of all. They have yeah. a million gods, according to some sources. Well, not million. But the, the Rig Veda yeah. talks about Brahman being this all that you are Brahman, I am Brahman. The the, the couch is Brahman. Brahman's the all, right? Brahman creates the world in the beginning. And, uh, like, that's a very monotheistic te- approach. And, and, and several deities in the Rig Veda. I mean, Agni, yeah. Agni is often presented as the only. Yeah, yeah. The, so it's the, very the common, source yeah. and the only. But Agni, of course, is, 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 is central uh, uh, to the Rig Veda. And, 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 and fire in general is, is, is seen as a. As a uh, especially the Persian in, thought. Especially, yeah. I mean, in the Avesta. Right. Uh, as the son of fire, the son of Ahura Mazda. Yeah. Uh, gets it, gets its own treatment uh, in the, in the uh, very very special treatment, especially in the Gothas. So in the early layers of the of the so um, monotheism or or moving to, more towards a monistic uh, view of, of or, or concentrating focusing on just one deity. Um, um, ancient ancient cultures in time and location. So sometimes it might be the same culture. But in one city, it's more monistic, and in another, it's right. more plural. Or over time, in the same location, it might be more monistic or more plural. The, the, there is always vacillation between between these types of uh, of of, of yeah. cult. You know, in the Achaemenid inscriptions up to Artaxerxes II, Ahura Mazda is pretty much the only deity. The only one. I mean, they talk about the other gods who are right. They, are, yeah. they talk about other gods or all the gods. 
so they recognize that they're the existence of course they are not monotheistic in the modern sense of the word. right well, anyway. but the only one <laughs> yeah <laughs> that doesn't exist. i mean yeah there, there is no i mean even today there is even no. islam has other spirits that's right yeah. that's right even islam who is i mean islam is really the first um system the first religious system that took the uh the tawhid the one the oneness of god as the central Central aspect of aspect religion. of religion, yeah. But even there, even after they, they you know, they I identify the Tawhid, Druze and all these other spirits. They are all, yeah. yeah. I mean, all these other spirits, and a lot of uh, of scholars, early scholars of Islam, had to debate what what does it mean? You yeah. know, what does the Tawhid mean? How does it how does it apply? Yeah. And so, um, yeah. And so, uh, monotheism is very mm-hmm. is very. Um, you know, kind of uh, abstract. Right? Now, you, you brought up the Persians, and you brought up the Avesta, and the, and the fire temples, and this is another aspect that you write about, is there is it, what appears to be, from your from your research, a lot of influence on Yahwism from Zoroastrianism. Can you tell us more about that? So the Zoroastrianism of the Achaemenid period is different from today's Zoroastrianism, obviously. Yeah. How do we do? Who do we know exactly what was the Zoroastrianism of the Achaemenid period? I do talk. To, uh, so I, you know, recommend people can download this book. It's for it's available for download for free. I'll put like in the description. And, and, in the description. And and uh, and they can read more about this and uh, and how we you know how we define and 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 and, and define Achaemenid Zoroastrianism, but it was the the cultic system of the empire. Now, the Achaemenid Empire wasn't just a new empire, but it was an empire, a, the, the world's first superpower. The first well, empire. superpower, too. Well, I mean, multicultural, all, I mean, most empires have to be. They have to be. They right? have to be. So they were not the first multicultural. Empires have to be multicultural. But they were the first real superpower in the sense that they. They had a vision that that did not exist before, an ideology ideology that didn't exist before. You read Xenophon and, and Thucydides, and it seems like a lot of these per, or Greek aristocrats in Sparta and in Athens wanted the Persians to be in charge. Yeah, they voted against Greek hegemony, so they were well, doing yeah, something. Yes, yes, that that also has to be said that it's. Uh, uh, the Persians knew how to manipulate uh, sure, their. Sure, I'm their, sure that's part of it. I mean, they actually <laughs> bribed the oracles right. to to give the uh, the oracles that they wanted to give. So, yeah. uh, so they knew how it's to a little more messy. Yeah, exactly. Think, they, yeah. they knew how to manipulate, um, but it was successful. I mean, they did manipulate successfully for for a time. You know, not always, not not everywhere. Uh, they always had problems at some uh, somewhere in the in the Greek world, but they were very very effective. But my, my point is. That they had an ideology to guide them. Uh, the Assyrians, if you look at the Assyrians, the Neo Assyrians, Neo Babylonians, they are in their inscriptions. The king just goes in, says, "I captured this, I captured this, I captured this." The kings trembled before me. The king, the, yeah. or I flayed this person, yeah. or I captured, I destroyed, blah blah. And that's always what they do. Yeah. The Achaemenids are not like that at all. Uh, I mean, they, they, of course, they all also conquer, but they always. Do that from a theological perspective. Mm. So about seventy-five percent of the all um, Achaemenid inscriptions begin with a creation account. You know, for you're talking about an imperial inscription that begins with an, an account of creation. Oh, really? Yeah, a short account of creation. So Ahura Mazda, the great, the, the great god, created who created this earth, who created the, the sky far, I and mean, then they have this ability to. To represent something that is far, the grammatical ability to represent that, the sky that, that are far, this earth that is near, and he created man. He created happiness for man. It's beautiful, uh, and he created Darius, right? And he created Darius in order to bring the order back to the way it was in creation. But the but but seventy five percent of all imperial inscriptions begin with this context of Hura Mazda as this creator deity. Mm. The seventy-five percent of, of inscriptions of any any significant length. I'm not talking about. Uh, there are we have fragments, uh, small fragments here and there, but I'm talking about inscriptions that have any significant length. Seventy-five percent of them begin with a short creation account sure. to introduce the king uh, from Darius on, the king as the one who represents Ahura Mazda on Earth and right. is in charge of 
recreating the world back and bringing it back like to a messiah world. thing. In, in many ways, yeah. Which in is many, what Cyrus shows up as. That's right, that's right. Although Cyrus, of course, does, did not leave any, any no. inscription like that. Right. But yeah, I mean, so that was part of th- this ideology, seeing everything as part of creation and part of bringing back into the good creation, uh, the world back into the good creation and, 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 and promoting this ideology throughout the empire. That is huge. That is new. That is. They seem to influence the Greeks. In that sense. They influence the Greeks everyone. Yeah. They influence the Greeks. They influence the Egyptians. They influence, of course, the Yahwists, yeah. the Babylonians. They influenced everyone that they were in contact with. It was a, uh, it was a very significant time in the history of, of, of at least of what's called the Western world. I mean, the world that was affected by, uh, by the Persians, by the Iranians. And unfortunately, the importance, the impact of the Achaemenid Empire is not as recognized as it should be. Yeah. I mean, even there are great academic books that come out uh, that talk about purity, that talk about all kinds of el- of, of uh, elements of life in the um, in the in Mesopotamia, in the ancient Near East. And they talk about the Sumerians, they talk about the Akkadians, talk about oh, but somehow they don't look to the east. They don't see further to the east from modern day Iraq. For whatever reason, even to this day, so many good, really important books have this, unfortunately, do not look to the Iranian sphere, mm-hmm. which is a huge mistake because the Iranian empires, the pre, pre-Islam Iranian empires, ruled over the entire um, Near East. Right. For about a thousand years. Sasanians. Sasanians. From the Achaemenids, yeah. Achaemenids with a short break in the middle after that. Parthians. To the Parthians and then Sasanians. And then Sasanians. Yeah. And so about a thousand years of almost continuous rule over this area, over the, uh, you know, the ancient Near East. And it's almost ignored in scholarship. Yeah. Today. And with, this is one of the reasons. Uh, what about the Elamites? Aren't they the proto Persians in, in a sense or no? No, no, that's a different story. But uh, the reason I, 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 I conceived of the conference that uh, eventually led to this, uh, to this book, Yahwism under the Achaemenid Empire, right. was because of how little attention people in our, in my field, you know, uh, um, uh, direct to the Achaemenids. And I wanted to change that. And yeah. I think this book is, is, is really kind of opening up now a new, a new, um, a new phase yeah. in evaluating the history of, uh, of the um of the area you brought up last time we discussed we brought up the yasna you brought up the the haoma drink ritual and the fire the fire holder um is there anything else that we find in early yahwism which is pro proto judaism whatever you want to call it yahwism before judaism is there anything else we find that the persians are bringing to the table that that makes its way into yahwism yeah, I mean, so we talked about, I mean, the fire is, is central to a number of, so in my, in my article and also in the, I mean, I mentioned in several places, but I also mentioned it in my article in this book, the fire holder, which is a better, better term than fire altar, yeah. because it is not an altar. Yeah. So the fire holder in a, 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 a um, in a Vestan term or a, in the Vestan slash Persian term, a combination of the word for fire, uh, Atrodan, which the, the, Atrodan. The, the, that's found in Jerusalem. No, that's found at Elephantine Elephantine, in the I'm temple. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. In the temple of Elephantine. Yeah. Um, Is it in within, the Holy of Holy section? What part? Is we it? don't know, okay. but it's somewhere within the within the confines yeah. of the of the temple. Exactly where, and I'm not sure even that they had a Holy of Holies there necessarily. Yeah. But inner sanctum. I mean. Inner sanctum. I mean, they probably did Most because also the, the the Egyptians did. Yeah. So they had within the confines of their temple, or at least associated with their temple. They had um, they had an atrodan, which is a technical term. It is very, and it, for anyone who doesn't know, it's it's a it's not a Semitic term. That's right. It's obviously being borrowed from a different culture. Yeah, and it's a cultic term. I yeah. mean, they knew what they were doing. If they just wanted to say, well, there's something that hold a fire holder, they could have said, they could have said duda de nura in, in Aramaic, for example. So it's, yeah. so they could have expressed this in a different way, but no, they they decided to take to use this technical term. It's uh, Definitive which is proof of influence on realism by the Persians, but very intimate. I mean, very, very intimate, because yeah. 
when you have a fire holder in your own um, in your own temple, that's that's pretty that's that's a that's a statement. Now we talked about this so-called Passover letter, yeah. and according to my analysis of it, what's what's expressed in that document is not the Passover, for a number of reasons, which I explain. It's clearly in the month of Nisan that the, de- the letter is is sent. So it's the beginning. Nisan is the beginning of the year. Yeah. So first yeah. Month. So it's it's the first month, and, and the fifteenth and fourteenth is the full moon. The night between the fourteenth and the fifteenth is the full moon. Is the full moon, right? Yeah, it's the middle of the month, right? Yeah. So the ceremony, according to my analysis, that is, uh, or the observance that uh, Hananiah is asking the people to observe around the full moon and seven days forward, I think, is 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 a Zoroastrian, is a form of the Yasna, the Zoroastrian Yasna, because. What we do have, again, it's very fragmentary, the actual document, but we, we do have from it is something related to a, an important drink. Uh, he, the, it doesn't say how oh, okay. but in the, uh, in the text, clearly the drink is important, and uh, the necessity to keep pure is, is central. Right. And, of course, the halma is a drink that needs to be consumed when you are in a pure state. Yeah. The uh, Hananya does not even explain to them what he means by purity. So, clearly, it's something there, that they already there knew. You know. Good point. And the, the the word for uh, kind of barley is 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 uh, or um, it, other uh, certain people also interpret it as leaven uh, appears in the text for the drink. But, no, oh, after okay. after the drink, but uh, no, like there is no. First. But it's not. It, there is no prohibition to, uh, against it, yeah. like there would be in a Passover. Yeah. And there is nothing in the text or in any other text from Elephantine that hints at this observance right. recurring. Which means it's not a feast. It's not a festival. I mean, a festival day. by definition recur is something that is either every year, maybe every seven years, or every also full moon. But it's 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 yeah. something that's recurring. But also, if they were if they were doing it every year before that, why would they be getting a letter telling them to do it? They right. already know how to do it. Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah I didn't think about that. Yeah. That's a good point. But uh, this is so, a brand new thing to them. So that's that's crazy. This late in the game, four nineteen BCE, for the first time. They're hearing about or learning or being told to do some sort of thing at what should be Passover. At the time, the Nisan 14, they're being told by their constituents, hey, do this ritual, get pure, drink this drink, do it on this day. And it's not the Passover. Right. And we're talking 419 BCE, way later in the game. This is centuries after when most people think the Torah was well known. Right. That's a big deal. That is a big deal. It's game changer. That is a big deal. So that's just really to me. That's kind of a game changer. I mean, we've always discussed at length the names of people. Um, they're not naming their children after biblical names until after for fourth century. Now we have this letter for the first time ever. They're being informed about some sort of observance. Maybe not even all. The, maybe just for a one time thing. We don't really know. But it seems to indicate that there isn't a Passover yet. All right. That's right. There is no Passover yet. Uh, there is no. And now it's interesting that the word Pascha, the word, the word for Passover, that will, the word that will be associated later on with the Passover, and I'll explain why I'm saying this, uh, does appear early in the uh, in the record of the Aoistic record in Atalantia. So in the first half, so to speak, uh, it's hard to date. Bec- there's no date on these documents, so it's hard to know exactly. Where to date them, but they were probably at the beginning of the uh, of the of the um, of, of the uh, uh, presence of the Aus on Elephantine, so beginning of the fifth century BCE. We have two documents or two and a half documents, maybe. Uh, the third one is uh, is not absolutely clear, but so I'll put it aside. So two documents that have the term Pascha, the term for Passover, um, in these documents, and these documents, what's uh, common to these documents is that they reflect a very acute sense of anxiety in both cases. Uh, in these documents, it is clear that the Pascha is not a fixed date. So it's not the 14th or the 15th of Nisan. So it, it's not associated with the fifth. And how do we know that? Because in one of these documents, in one of these ostraca, uh, the author asks the, rece- the, the person who received the ostraca, the addressee, uh, tell me when are you going to observe the Passover? Now the past the biblical Passover is one feast, 
where you could never ask that question because yeah, it's not it's always the same day. Well, it's not only the same day, but it's also the same hour of the day, right? right. Between the between the evenings, as it as, as it says. So uh-huh. it's not just the the day, but it's it's so precise that it's that it goes to the actual hour of the day. You never, if it's the, if it's the biblical version of it, you never you will never ask uh, when you're uh, when are you going to observe the Passover. But these two terms. Um, uh, in, in both documents, the, 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 the context is very, very high levels of anxiety. Um, the first Ostrakon really talks about the children. The entire document revolves around the safety of the children, take care of the children, keep them in close one-to-one watch over the children. Don't let anyone close uh, approach these children except for their mother. I mean, it goes up again and again and again about the, the children that need to be kept very, very close, in close watch and very anxious about the children. The second one is about uh, upcoming uh, inspections uh, that are coming up and in, in, a, in a document that needs to be understood very, very clearly and a lot of anxiety around this, this letter that they received. Anyway, so these two are very, very, uh, you know, very stressful um, events. and. It has already been proposed, even before we looked at these ostraca, it's been proposed that the Passover initially was an apotropaic, uh, meaning uh, a, 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 an observance meant to keep the evil eye away. Now, right. to, to, so, and, we, and it is echoed in the, in the Bible as well. Uh, you have the mashchit, you have the, the angel that goes around uh, killing the firstborn, right? Yeah. And, and, you, and you have the to... The angel of death. The angel of death, and you have to... Uh, to paint the blood on the on the lentils and the uh, you know the kind of the entrance point into the house uh, that is an apotropaic observance. So you know, painting blood at the, at the entrance at the entry point to the house to protect the house. Um, so so that is echoed in the Bible as well. That is probably and I believe it is the case that this is the original meaning of of the Passover in apotropaic observance, uh, keeping the evil eye away. Um, and that's what we see at Elephantine in the early part. In the late part, which is the so-called Passover letter, um, the word Pascha does not appear, uh, at least in, in what we have preserved. Uh, neither the word for the words for matzah, uh, which is which is the kind of the unleavened bread, in the Aramaic, which is patio in Aramaic, doesn't appear in the preserved fragments that we have. In the text that we have, those main terms do not appear at all. Yeah, and which and they clearly were. I mean, at least Pascha was known to this community decades earlier. So, and they don't use it at least in, in, again, in the version that we have. So, it looks like at that point in time, um, again, I have to speculate because I, I, I don't have overwhelming data. I have two data points here and one here. But from that image that we do have, and we have to go by what we have in our field, as in any science. Um, if we, if there are new discoveries that might completely change the view, sure. and I'll, I'll be very happy to have new data yeah. come in that would disprove what I'm saying. That's yeah. fine. That's how science progresses. How it works. But now, for what we have, based on what we have now, uh, it looks like the pa- the Passover, the Pascha, uh, that that eventually made it into the Bible, started out as an apotropaic observance, and what we have in the so-called Passover letter might be one step in the evolution. Of this, uh, of this observance. Well said, and uh, get the book. Links in the description. You can download it for free. Yahwism under the Ottoman Empire. You have just attained true gnosis.